Kia ora everyone and welcome to Cobblestones Chronicles. I'm Jeanette Wallace-Gedge and it's my pleasure to be with you this morning to give you some background on cobblestones, some telling you some things that are going on there and to give you some bits of history from the Wairarapa region. And actually this morning I've just driven back from Pukaha, the National Wildlife Centre. I've just dropped off a young um, Spanish guy that we've got staying with us at the moment. And he is so excited to go and see a kiwi. It's just lovely. He's just absolutely desperate to go and see one. So I just hope that the kiwis are peeking out um, and out and about in their enclosures today so that he gets to see it. I'm sure he'll be enchanted on the way. He's going to go and see the eel feeding and the um, carving that's going on up there because there's a carving studio these days and um, I'm sure he'll have a lovely time. We always take our visitors up to Pukaha because I think it's just such a wonderful thing to have and to give people uh, just an idea of what it must have been like to be here when it was virgin bush all around and and this is what our early settlers came to um, whether it was the Maori about 12, 1300, 1400 years ago um, because I was talking to him about the Moa this morning and um, or our uh, European settlers who came here later. So, it's almost Christmas. I hope you're getting excited about it. I certainly am. Um, not least because it's my birthday and my wedding anniversary before Christmas. So this is always an exciting time of year for me. Thoroughly enjoy it. My birthday always, according to my husband, my birthday always seems to last about a week. But <laughs> there you go. What's a birthday if you don't celebrate it properly? So before I do anything else, what I might do is um, play you a tune. And this is um, a tune, a traditional Scottish tune, about Miss Fogarty's Christmas cake. And uh, sung and played by a friend of mine, Alistair Brown, and it's about a traditional Christmas cake. I hope you've all got your Christmas cakes underway. Um, I'm a little bit late this year because one of the things I'm going to do today is buy the fruit for it. Um, I need to get into into uh, Moore Wilson's and buy the fruit. So um, put us all in the mood for Christmas. Let's listen to Miss Fogarty's Christmas cake. As I sat in my window last evening, the letterman brought it to me. A little girl tailed invitation, saying, girl, who will you come over to tea? I knew that the Fogarty sent it, so I'll end for old friendship's sake. The first thing that they gave me to try was a slice of her Christmas cake. There were plums and prunes and cherries, citron and raisins and cinnamon too. There was nuts and cloves and berries, and a top that was nailed on with glue. There were caraway seeds in abundance to work up a fine stomach ache. They would kill a man twice after eating a slice of Miss Fogarty's Christmas cake. Miss Mulligan wanted to try it, but really it wasn't no use. No, we worked on it over an hour, we couldn't get none of it loose. Till Kelly came in with a hatchet, and Murphy came in with a saw. That cake was enough by the powers above to paralyze any man's jaw. There were plums and prunes and cherries, citron and raisins and cinnamon too. There was nuts and cloves and berries, and a crust that was nailed on with glue. There were caraway seeds in abundance to work up a fine stomach cake that would kill a man twice after eating a slice of Miss Fogarty's Christmas cake. Miss Fogarty, proud as a peacock, sat smiling and primping away till she tripped over Flanagan's brogans and she spilled some home brew in her tea. Gil Hooley, she said, you're not eating, have a little bit more for me sake. Oh no, Miss Fogarty, said I, if I had it, my stomach would break. 
there were plums and prunes and cherries, citron and raisins and cinnamon too. There was nuts and cloves and berries, and a cross that was nailed on with glue. There were caraway seeds in abundance to work up a fine stomach cake. That would kill a man twice after eating a slice of Miss Fogarty's Christmas cake. Maloney was hit with a colic. Adonald's a pain in his head. Magnot and lay down on the sofa, and he swore that he wished he was dead. Miss Bailey went into hysterics, and there she did wriggle and shake. And all of us swore they were poisoned by eating that Christmas cake. There were plums and prunes and cherries, citron and raisins and cinnamon too. There was nuts and cloves and berries, and a crust that was nailed on with glue. There were caraway seeds in abundance to work up a fine summer cake. They would kill a man twice after eating a slice of Miss Fogarty's Christmas cake. Isn't that a lovely idea for a Christmas cake? I've got to say that um, I think it's hilarious all the things that went into it. And I gather that's a, a variation on a traditional tune. So I um, won't be putting all of those things in my Christmas cake this year, but um, you never know. Um, now, one of the other things that I wanted to talk to you about today was just to let you know that we're having carols at Cobblestones on the 16th of December. Uh, the Santa Parade will come through Greytown. It won't go on the main street because, of course, due to traffic restrictions, um, it's quite hard to close State Highway 2. So um, it's coming down one of the side streets, but which runs absolutely parallel. So you can still go and wave to all the floats and then ends up in the rugby club and where everybody will get off the floats and come over to Cobblestones and join us for carols at Christmas at Cobblestones. And it's going to be a lovely afternoon. It uh, starts at four o'clock where we'll have the carols and the music starts about 4.30. You'll be able to buy food and you'll be able to um, buy um, drinks as well. We're actually going to have a cash bar, so if you fancy a glass of wine or a nice cold beer after the Santa Parade, you'll be able to get them. Lots of drinks for the kiddies as well, so don't worry about that. And it's going to be, a, a, we hope, a lovely afternoon. Um, we do have a plan. If it rains like it did last year, you'll be able to um, you'll be able to come the following day, Sunday the seventeenth instead. So that's um, for pre-Christmas. Now I just want to let you know as well that um, the friends of Cobblestones have decided to open up cobblestones on on new year's day we'll be open we're always open anyway we only close on christmas day itself but we thought that it would be a lovely chance for families to come and just have an after christmas picnic on the grounds there will be food for sale and there will not be a bar but it's very much a family day out. So come and Koha entry, um, come and join us on New Year's Day, bring a picnic or buy our own delicious food and just come and relax on the grass. We hope it will be a lovely day. And the weather forecast is supposed to be that we have good weather from Christmas onwards. So come and join us. It will be just, it will be great fun. Really lovely. Now, um, I was um, going to play you another tune now. I thought you might enjoy this one. It's called Black Sand. And it's um, written by someone I know, Lynn Wilkins. She's a lovely New Zealand girl who lives up uh, the west coast of the North Island. So just enjoy Black Sand. <laughs> Do you know how the 
story goes Boy meets girl, they get it on Now their love is growing Sand, a lovely song from Lynn Wilkins, who lives on the West Coast, where, of course, there is black sand. And um, it's such a pretty place, Raglan. If you don't know it, if you get a chance, do go and have a look. Um, so this morning, apart from talking about cobblestones, because I just wanted to say, if you haven't been to cobblestones recently... It's well worth coming to have a look and see what we've been up to. We've been doing some refurbishing of the Haswell stables because, of course, cobblestones is called cobblestones because of the big original uh, flat piece of cobbled um, courtyard right in front of Haswell stables. Hastwell Stables was one of the main places uh, that 
the coaches and carts stopped after they'd come over the Rumatakas or even round the coast because it was a place to uh, give your horses a rest, not so much change them, but give them a rest and stop overnight and have a lovely meal, probably of mutton stew, at the um, at the Rising Sun Hotel, which was just opposite Cobblestones, or where the Haswell stables still are, and it is the original building. So we are so lucky to have that original building with the original cobbles in front of it. And there's some exciting developments in that we're building a ticket office for, because there would have been one in an old shed which is right next to the stables. And there's a lovely display inside of a horse in one of the stalls kitted up the way it would have been when the um, when the horses were used to bring the coaches and the carts over the Rumatakas. And it's absolutely fascinating to look at it and see. We also have a cutout of a rather charming young stable boy who's standing there. And um, we're thinking that maybe it would be fun to run a competition to give our stable boy an appropriate name. But um, meantime, do come and have a look and uh, tell us what you think. There's also, this year we've um, installed uh, uh, about a one-fifth size coach, which you can you can climb into if you're small. If you're an adult size person, I wouldn't recommend it because it's it's a one-fifth size. But the kids love it because they can climb into it and look at the windows and wave. It's becoming, <laughs> um, it's starring in quite a few pictures on people's Instagrams and Facebooks by now, I would say. So of course, in the beginning, William Robertson Haswell was the son of a Westmoreland carrier and he'd arrived in New Zealand in 1853. That was when the Greytown Small Farms Association came into being and he bought two one-acre blocks a distance to the north. Soon after, he successfully tendered for the fortnightly mail service from Wellington to the Wairarapa and then ventured into carrying goods. This led to a very tricky situation where one of his drivers in 1863 um, had some problems. We also know that by 1857, Hastwell stables were in operation and that by 1861, he was the owner of sections 77 and 79. That's the area now encompassed by cobblestones. And he owned them until his death in 1879. By 1866, he had a regular mail and passenger service, which seven years later ran daily between Wellington and the Wairarapa. An article in the Cobblestones Chronicle newspaper named the road over the Rumataka Hill the Bridal Track, as after the 1855 earthquake it was na narrow and dangerous. It was many weeks before a pack horse could use it, let alone a coach. Uh, 1857 article in the same publication stated it was perilous and often coaches were snowed in or blown over. So travelling that road was not for the faint-hearted. The Haswell stable built in 1857 was one of a number which housed up to 70 horses. There was a blacksmith shop erected to cater for the needs of the businesses. It was one of three buildings that were originally on site when the museum opened. In 1879, a few years after going into partnership with James Makara, Haswell died. Makara ran the business through to sometime between 1880 and, and 1888, when the establishment of the Fell Railway made 
that business really redundant because, of course, everyone turned on to trains. And trains are always very exciting. Now, if those of you who are watching on television today, you might not know what television, the word for television is in Māori. And um, we, as we come in the front door to Aro, there's a challenge to learn a new Māori word every day. And I just happened to pick up the card for television today. I'm holding it up if you're watching on TV. And you know, the word for television, or the words, are pu'aka fokata. And so, pu'aka fokata. For pu'aka fokata. Sorry, I'll say that again. Pu'aka fokata. So that's what how you say television in Māori. And I think that's quite neat. I enjoyed that. Okay, let's have another song. So, um, I thought we might have one called Party Town as we're all gearing up for parties at the moment. And I'm just searching for the track. Here we go. This is Party Town. And it's by Alan Downs from his CD, Moving On. He comes from the Hawks Bay, but it's all really kind of part of the Waru Rapa, isn't it? So, and I know from talking to Alan that sheep farming in the hill country in the Hawks Bay is very similar to sheep country farming in the Waru Rapa. So here we go, party town. It's Friday night, the town's alive, the bars are packed and the weekend's welcome. Everybody's on the town to celebrate a week that's over. Party town, yours and mine, drinking beer, drinking wine. The streets are hot, the week is shot. It's time for celebrating party town. Wellington out on the streets, it's pumping happy town. Party sounds, everybody's just hanging on the vibe. Everybody's getting high, blowing their mind. And then Saturday comes round again, a race on out, create some mayhem. Summertime, yours and mine. The time to get half crazy, running wild, that crazy mile between Courtney Place and Manor's Mall. Run around the bars in town, drinking, singing, it's amazing. Wellington, party town, out on the streets, it's pumping, happy town. Party sounds, everybody's just hanging on the vibe. Everybody's getting high, blowing their mind. You hit Cuba Street, you find a place to eat. Always when you've been drinking, you're hanging out for any food about. All that hype, what were you thinking? Music sounds all around. The bars and the nightclub venues, serious restaurants, fast food, French food, Asian, Mexican, Wellington. Party town, out on the streets, it's pumping happy town. Party sounds, everybody's just hanging on the vibe. Everybody's getting high, blowing their mind. And then without warning, it's Monday morning, blurry eyeballs, birdcage yawning. You stumble out, please don't shout. My head feels like exploding, five days again till the weekend. How will I survive the Monday? Can't think straight or concentrate After three nights hard out party Wellington, party town Out on the streets it's pumping Happy town, party sounds Everybody's just hanging on the vibe Everybody's getting high Blowing their mind And then it's Friday night The town's alight, the bars are packed The weekend's welcome Everybody's on the town Celebrate a week that's over, party town, yours and mine, drinking beer, 
drinking wine, the streets are hot, the week is shot. It's time for celebrating party town. Wellington out on the street, it's pumping happy town. Party sounds, everybody's just hanging on the vibe. Everybody's getting high, blowing their minds in party town. Party Town, Wellington on a Friday night. So, not tomorrow, but a week on Friday, that's exactly what we'll be doing. But I'm not too sure that we'll be um, out too late. <laughs> One of the things I'm finding as I get um, into my 70s is that um, my idea of a late night is 11 o'clock these days. I used to be a bit of a party girl out um, till, you know, 2 a.m. And in fact, um, later today I've got to have a, I'm going to have a, a telephone call with a friend of mine who's just had a birthday. And she and I were in our early 30s together and had a lot of fun going out on the town in Auckland, actually. Um, but um, she was a bit of a terror because every now and again she'd say, Oh, let's have another glass of bubbly. Usually around midnight. Huh. Luckily we both lived in um, within taxi rides of getting back home. So, back to talking about party towns. Um, I was reading this book touring Edwardian New Zealand. Um, if you're looking on TV at the moment, I'm, I'm holding up the cover. It's by, by a historian, Paul Moon. And it's an absolutely delightful book because it gives a real insight into what it was like to be a tourist in New Zealand in Edwardian, in Edwardian times. And um, I, was, I want to read you a bit about um, the Grand Hotel Rotorua because while the Duke and Duchess were visiting Rotorua, a new bathhouse was opened, appropriately named the Duchess, which the handbook, which was the, the handbook he's referring to is Cook's tour of New Zealand, promoted, handbook promoted as a beautifully arranged swimming bath with two private, private baths attached, supplied from the Rachel Spring, which was much appreciated by those bathing mainly for pleasure. This was not a royal endorsement of Thomas Cook's tours to the region, but the implication was that if a visit to Rotorua was good enough for the Duke and Duchess of Cornwall, then it would certainly be a worthwhile destination for the British traveller heading to New Zealand. And there were no concerns about transport in this sulfuric setting. Steamers transversed the lakes and coaches were available for Thomas Cook travellers. Bookings for transport and entry to all the tourist venues in the district could be made from the firm's local office. And that's one of the reasons that we're putting a ticket office into the stables because the ticket office was really often um, a, a kind of a hub and of course the post would have gone in there too. Thomas Cook divided up Rotorua into various segments, all in relatively close proximity to each other, but each containing its own collection of attractions. The first of these was Oti Ohinimutu on the southern shore of Lake Rotorua. The name of the settlement derived from an event involving Ihinga, the grandson of Tamate Kapua, who had captained the migratory Te Arawa canoe from Pol Polynesia to New Zealand around the 13th century. During an episode of internecine conflict, Ihinga's daughter had been killed. In commemoration of that event, Ihinga named the location Ohini Mutu, the place where the girl's life is finished. 
About two centuries later, a sudden bout of seismic activity caused the pa on the site to sink rapidly into the lake. This happened so swiftly that possibly dozens of inhabitants were killed as a result. One outcrop of rock that remained above the water is now the site of St. Face Anglican Church. The current Neo-Gothic church was built in 1914 and replaced the Anglo-Norman church that had been constructed there in 1885. The handbook, the Thomas Cook's handbook, recommended Ohinimutu for its streaming streams, lakelets and springs, its bubbling and boiling halls, its thousand hissing springs, spitting and spluttering jets, its shimmering and stewing mud pits, and for the many curious sights and canny noises and sulphurous odours arising therefrom. The shallow pools framed in by slads and stones and heated by the overflow of some contiguous springs are open and are publicly used by the Māori at all times, particularly in the early morning and the evening. Private baths, which are comfortably sheltered and are supplied by natural streams of springs, are provided at the Lake Hotel for the use of visitors. And there's a lovely um, little drawing in this book, um, actually it might be an early photograph, of the Lake Hotel. And it, it looks absolutely charming, if probably possibly not quite what Edwardian visitors were looking for. But it sounds, it sounds as if people going to Rotorua had a jolly fine time taking the baths and of course a lot of them would have been used to taking the waters or being immersed into sulfurous baths and around various places in Europe not least Bath in the southwest of England itself there was also the springs at Lourdes in uh, France, which is um, just on the edge of the Pyrenees, and Baden-Baden, uh, of course, had famous springs. And there was a, another one at Tunbridge, in uh, a little further north in England. So there's always been springs, and some of them are hotter than others. Of course, ours are very hot, so we do have to be careful. Okay, so how about another song? And um, what I've, I've done is I've queued up uh, a song from I'm just I want to read you the, uh, this bit about it. Um, I queued up another song from a CD called "The Pleasure Will Be Mine." It's another Scottish song. I'm feeling a bit Scottish today because we've just had St Andrew's Day and of course so many of our settlers were, were from Scotland. And this one is um, Black is the colour of my true love's hair and um, this is a traditional a traditional um, Scottish song although um, it's associated with music in the Appalachian Mountains, but we think it originated in Scotland because it does refer to the River Clyde in the lyrics, which is a bit of a clue. So here we have, um, Black is the colour of my true love's hair, which is a very pretty song. Here we go. <laughs> Of my true love's hair Her lips are like Some roses fair The sweetest smile The gentlest tongue I love the ground Whereon she stands Love my love, Noel 
she knows I love the ground Where on she goes I hope the day Of my true love's hair Her lips are like Some roses fair The sweetest smile The gentlest hands I love the ground Whereon she stands For tomorrow For satisfied I never can be I write her letters A few short lines And suffer death Of my true love's hair Her lips are like Some roses is fair Her sweetest smile The gentlest hands I love the ground Whereon she stands Oh Thank you.
wasn't that lovely? Uh, beautiful rendition. The flute playing is from Lynn Wilkinson on that, um, and she plays flute be beautifully. So that was Wilkie Mac's version of Black is the Colour of My True Love's Hair. And um, continuing on about cobblestones, um, one of the things I'd really encourage you to look at when you visit is to have a look at our two waka because they are there in the museum. They are, of course, on loan to us because um, waka are ta'onga Māori and um, sacred to the tangata whenua and always need to be treated with the greatest respect, of course. Um, because ta'onga are the property of the iwi they came from. They're returned upon request, all, of course, but we're really fortunate to be entrusted with these two beautiful old traditional waka. And we have on the wall behind the the two waka, we have an old photograph of family, a Māori family, going uh on the walker. We think they might have been going to church or going to uh, an occasion like that because they're all dressed up and it looks really great and it gives you an idea of what it would have been like to go on the the walker. And isn't it interesting because walker is uh, a word that um, is really well known and in New Zealand, although it's a Maori word, um, and even the young Spanish chap who's been staying with us knew Walker already. He knew what I was talking about when I was talking about Walker. And it's it's amazing how so many Maori words are just in common use these days, which is, is great because I reckon it gives New Zealand New Zealand English or New Zealand language, whatever we want to call it, its distinctive own personality, which um, which I think is really good. So there, yeah, great. Um, I've also got, um, I picked up another card today um, and because this one's really quite interesting because of course I start this program at midday and on a Thursday morning. That's when it's actually recorded and goes out live and then it also is uh, goes out at other times as well as part of a recording because I come in every couple of weeks. And did you know that uh, the word for midday in Te Reo is awatia? Awatia. So my programme starts at awatia on Thursdays. Isn't that good to know? I'm really enjoying that. I've been um, learning Tereo for all oh, on and off for several years now. When I lived in Auckland, I was fortunate enough to work at Auckland University of Technology, and we of course had the Māori faculty, Tiara Potama, and um, Toby Curtis was the um, he was the head of the faculty. He was the dean, and um, he was a, just a wonderful man who really managed to guide me into understanding the Maori, or a bit of understanding of Maori culture, and even had me um, learn about why I was introduced at every meeting that we attended, um, if I hadn't met the people before. And um, I really enjoyed that because to have my, my Scottish heritage acknowledged was, felt very special and of course to understand what we were acknowledging and there's so much commonality between the way we do things in Scotland and the Maori way that um, it does make it easier to to go alongside I reckon. Right now um, I thought to finish up today what I might do is play a song called Southern Land, which, yes, I know it's about the South Island. And um, it's actually about a trip we took through the Catlins several years ago. But one of the things that struck me this morning as I was talking, as I was driving up towards uh, 
Pukaha is that the um, the land around the, the forest in Pukaha reminded me so much of the Catlins and that must have been what the whole country looked like when people came here. When Māori came here 1400 years ago or so and when um, European settlers came here, you know, started coming here a couple of hundred years ago. So um, I think it's kind of appropriate. And if you listen carefully, in the middle you hear a bit of bird song, and it reminds me of um, going sailing to Great Barrier Island in the Haraki Gulf and wakening up in the morning to bird song because that you still waken up to the kind of bird song that you probably would have had in New Zealand in early times. I gather it's sometimes it was absolutely deafening, but um, not quite deafening these days. But um, I, I have to say that I heard, first heard this song about five o'clock in the morning because we were wakening up at five o'clock in the morning in the Catlins because of the the beautiful bird song. So here we go. Southern Land, written by Niels Gage. Southern Land Take my heart Light is born to your chiming song Take my heart Southern land The clock of night lifts for your dawn Mass and fern, vine and tree, the forest sips at your waterfall. Rock and sand, turquoise sea, last light love. On a seabird's call Take my heart Let my eyes awaken Southern land To your forests and mountains Take my heart It's yours for the taking Southern land My muse and my fountain Take my heart It beats to your rhythm Southern land This is where I stand my ground Take my heart It's beaten to your rhythm Southern land As the world turns around and around and around and around, and around. Southern land Glacier gouge and torrential rain Dust to dust I shall be held by love to your waking dream Southern land To your fire 
forests and mountains Take my heart It's yours for the taking Southern land My muse and my fountain Take my heart It beats to your rhythm Southern land This is where I stand my ground Take my heart It's beaten to your rhythm Southern land As the world turns around and around and around and around and around and around and around Southern land Southern Land by Niels Gedge and the vocalists on there were um, Sue Rose, Philip Gander, Roy McGuinness and of course Niels Gedge uh, who also played guitar. And did you hear the little birdies singing in the middle? I just think that bit's lovely. So thank you for being with me today. Um, I look forward to being with you again soon and I hope you stay safe. Don't get too stressed about Christmas. After all, it's really about family. Getting together with family, that's the most important thing. So um, take care. Speak to, speak to you again soon. I hope you'll enjoy me soon. Bye for now. <laughs>